Media. Today, as, as committed uh, by the Secretary General in this briefing, today we are having a media briefing to apprise you of the deliberations that are taking place in the National Executive Committee of the NC that is currently underway. And uh, the discussion this afternoon with yourselves will be about what is going to be briefed to you by the chairperson of the Economic Transformation Subcommittee of the National Executive Committee um, on a wide range of issues, but very specific issues that we are focusing on. I don't want to go into that detail because the, the chair will do a decent introductory job in that respect, but I do wish to um, introduce members of this uh, media panel this afternoon led by the chairperson, uh, Comrade Mamulu Gokubai, chairperson of the ETC subcommittee. And uh, to my right, Comrade uh, Husienzo Ramakupa, member of the National Executive Committee, also a public deployee, and, um, and who's also a member of the same subcommittee. To my extreme right, Comrade uh, Tula Sumasi, a deployee, of the ANC in government, uh, in empl employment and labor as minister. With that, let me hand over to Comrade Mamulugu. Thank you very much, Comrade uh, Mahlengwe. Um, thank you very much, members of the media public. Um, as ETC, we are leading the briefing this morning um, just to appraise members of the public around the work that we've been doing. We've got several issues that we're dealing with regularly. Um, and we present to the National Executive Committee as part of our work in the subcommittee. We are dealing this weekend, as Comrade Mahling was said, has said, um, we're dealing with various topics that were presenting before the, sub, uh, the NEC as the subcommittee. I'll just give you highlight, but we'll focus on two today. Um, we're dealing with, firstly, the issue around electricity, energy security, as you would have known in the last briefing of the NEC, we committed that every month or every time the NEC meets, we will provide an update to the NEC um, on the energy security because this is one of the areas that conference said we must act and we must act immediately. The second area of briefing will be focused on the issues around employment, equity, labor laws, um, and that you would understand that it has been an issue in the public domain. This precisely because we have feedback from our constituencies that tends to have confusion about what we intend to do, um, asking us if we are abandoning the non-racial character of the ANC. But secondly, those who are within our context in working with us and are wanting to understand what is it that the ANC government has signed between ourselves and also the solidarity uh, organization where you'd understand in terms of our motive forces people would not define solidarity as part of our motive forces so it is important for us to be able to address that and that's why we have the two comrades who are both members of the subcommittee of the NEC both in terms of their deployment and work and you'd understand that the subcommittee has extended its work beyond just members of the NEC but other colleagues who or comrades who are in government who are deployed within the portfolios that are within the economic space, but also other extended people. So we'll also brief the NEC on issues around cost of living and inflation. We'll also brief the NEC around issues of transformation, triple BE evaluation, which we have done. We had a mini workshop as the subcommittee. So those will come later and the spokesperson will guide in how we deal with it. But that's broadly the work that we are doing. More interested in what we have received as um, and in a, a directive from conference from our structures on what this NEC must be able to focus on. So we continue with that work. So I'm going to agree, um, ask Comrade Sputla to first um, brief you on the update around energy security because you'd understand that this is what would drive economic development and the recovery of our economy. And then immediately Comrade Tulas will come in on the issues around implement um, equity laws and then we'll take questions. Um, from that point, Comrade Speaker, over to you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Comrade Mamoloko. And uh, just to, to uh, re-emphasize the point that uh, Comrade Mamoloko was making, and that is uh, uh, energy electricity is a permanent feature of, uh, of uh, the agenda items of, uh, of the NEC. Um, the ANC had identified six priority areas when we, the president uh, unveiled the statement of the National Executive Committee on the occasion of uh, our anniversary, the January 8 uh, statement. Uh, and one of those is uh, uh, ending load shedding. Um, so the last time when we met as the NEC, we, we had presented a picture of uh, the, the energy landscape, electricity landscape, and at the time, we were uh, able to share with the NEC what we refer to as the winter outlook. Uh, and I want to just uh, provide you with the, the update, and this is the same update that is given to, to the NEC. The first one was that in relation to the winter outlook, we had uh, generated three scenarios. The first was the best case scenario. The best case in this instance means that uh, we are able to rein in the load shedding and in fact, we keep it at the uh, lower levels of uh, intensity. Um, and then there's a middle case scenario, and then there's a worst case scenario. So there were two um, primary assumptions that uh, underpins uh, the generation of the scenarios. The first one was that on the worst case scenario, was that uh, the levels of uh, the reliability and the efficiency of the units will not improve. So the last time when we were here, where the energy availability factor was uh, uh, hovering at about 48.5%. Uh, uh, and that's a combination of a number of things. The first one was that uh, the number of, uh, of trips and the regularity of those trips will take out about uh, 18,000 plus uh, megawatts of uh, generating capacity. So that was uh, uh, the first uh, indice in relation to, or variable in relation to the worst case scenario. The second um, indice in relation to the worst case scenario was that the uh, demand was going to peak at about uh, 34,000 megawatts. So essentially the gap between uh, uh, generation and demand will be such that uh, we are likely going to experience uh, the intensity of load shedding above what was the uh, previously recorded historic high of uh, stage six of load shedding. And that's why when I was here, I did indicate the last time that uh, uh, the probability of going to stage eight was real. If uh, we are not able to temper with the, the improvement in relation to the generation capacity and also are unable to uh, lower down the demand. Uh, so that's a scenario we painted. And I also shared with the NEC and uh, yourselves and the country the measures that we are taking to address uh, in the short, immediate term rather, um, the, uh, the realization of, uh, of that worst case scenario, how we undermine uh, the occurrence of that scenario. So the first one was uh, to continue to work with ESCOM and improve the energy availability factor. And on that, I'm happy to, to say to you that uh, we have made uh, tremendous strides. And like I said, we're sitting at about 48% uh, the last time when I was here of the energy availability factor and now we are stabilizing at about 60% uh, uh, of the energy availability factor. And what have we done to at attain those who had uh, isolated uh, uh, the most notorious power stations? Notoriety in this instance means those power stations that have got um, an installed uh, capacity that is uh, significantly higher. Uh, so I'm talking about those power stations that they have got packs of uh, packs I'm, I'm referring to units of generation of uh, 600 megawatts and, and plus. Uh, uh, and then secondly, the, the, those power stations are the ones that uh, uh, are giving us uh, low levels of, uh, of EAF. So we identified those uh, power stations and then also identified uh, the problems about the individual units. Uh, whether it's a boiler tube leak, you can mention the kind of uh, a technical failures that can result in the units being taken out. And then we work with ESCOM, including mobilizing private sector expertise uh, to be embedded in those uh, power stations. Uh, and of course, the, the major uh, occurrence that has happened between the last briefing to the NEC and now is that we have appointed the new head of generation, Mr. Begin Numa, who's got the, 
um, impeccable credentials um, comes uh, highly recommended someone who has worked uh, through the ranks of ESCOM previously before his uh, current stint as a head of generation. He was the head of Rotec, which is an engineering arm of, uh, of uh, ESCOM. And then we have succeeded also working with uh, that leadership to also get, uh, uh, if you like, uh, people with uh, the best experience inside ESCOM to be uh, in the leadership <coughs> of uh, some of these uh, stations that they are notorious for underperformance. And as I speak to you now, like I said, we have lifted the energy availability factor by 12 percentage points. Just to put that into context, um, one percentage point really amounts to about 477 uh, uh, megawatts of additional generating uh, capacity. Um, and that's why now we, we are attaining uh, the average levels that are just below shy of, uh, of uh, 30,000 megawatts, the availability factor. And we've been able to maintain that over a period of time, and that's why uh, the country has been observing a, a situation where about two-thirds of, uh, of the day we are not experiencing load shedding, or in instances where we do, we are able to keep that to stage one load shedding, and then we go to stage three. So that has been the, the permutation that we've been keeping uh, for the past three weeks or so. That uh, uh, communicates one big message is that we are succeeding in uh, maintaining those uh, uh, levels of efficiency, which uh, is something that uh, uh, has been uh, has been failing us. And then the second part was also on the, how we bend the diesel, the open cycle uh, gas turbines. Uh, uh, although uh, we've uh, been uh, in the midst and the throes of winter, uh, we have not been uh, burning it at the rate that we thought we would be burning it. So we've been able to save, uh, uh, if you like, uh, the ESCOM fiscal some money and then we'll engage them um, when, as and when they are required. We know in the next two weeks we'll be entering uh, uh, one of the coldest periods during the winter, and in fact, uh, the projections are that Monday uh, is going to be the coldest day recorded this so far in this winter period. So we'll see how we perform. And I, I was making the point at the NEC that the best measure is not where we are in relation to the stages of load shedding. The best measure is on the performance of those units. As long as we are able to maintain them at 60% and 60 plus, we'll be able to provide relief. And then in conclusion, we are also flagging the fact that, uh, of course, we, we are going to see this recovery, the improvement, and then there are those units at Kusile that will come on stream. Uh, unit 5, we, 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 we project to fire it by October. Unit 1, 2, 3, which was affected by the flue gas desulfurization, and we have gotten the exemptions from DFFE. Uh, those will be fired uh, by uh, no, uh, the first one uh, late November, the second one early December, and then the third one on the 24th of December. And if you put those together, we're talking uh, upwards of uh, 3,000 megawatts. So essentially, you're talking uh, about six percentage points. If you use that uh, uh, computation, I told you about one percentage points is uh, 477 megawatts. And like I said, in conclusion, we are cautioning about the future. The future is that if you don't address the transmission side of generation, we are likely going to end up in even a much worse uh, case scenario than is the case now. So that's the first part. The second part is about um, uh, the energy resources. Uh, so uh, we know there are issues around uh, the gas supply um, that we are drawing from Mozambique. I think that contract, uh, Sasol, that it has is likely to go in. It's projected to run out uh, in the near future, I think the next two to three years. And therefore, the reliability of, uh, of uh, gas supply is at risk. So it's important that we plan now about the, about the future so that we don't compromise the sovereignty, energy sovereignty of the country. But overall, I think we, we're making the, we are surpassing our expectation in, re, in relation to the performance of the units, and we are more than confident that the, uh, we should be able to survive the winter, will not experience the worst case scenario as we had projected, and will continue to see the improvements, and I'm very confident that load shedding will be behind us uh, very soon, and then we we'll now begin to work on uh, uh, creating uh, an additional buffer, um, uh, reserve margins to allow the economy to grow at the desired level. Thanks. Thank you very much, Congress Speaker. Let's move to Comrade Chulas. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thanks to Comrade Marshall, Comrade Mamluku, and Comrade Ramukhupa. The one of the central mandates of the African National Congress is to transform the economy. And the Employment Equity Act it's one of the measures it's one of the measures which are meant to transform the economy and it is against that background that the president signed the amendments to the employment equity act at the beginning of this year but what prompted that, remember that this act came in 1998, but an attempt to implement what we call the constitutional requirement to bring about equity and equal opportunity in the workplace has been very, very slow. Our reports from the Employment Equity Commission are indicating that we're moving at a very snail pace, especially at the level of management. And this has been particularly at the expense or at the cost of the Africans, the coloreds, the women and the people with disability. It's for that reason that we have these amendments. And all the amendments are doing, instead of saying, these targets must be voluntary by the employers themselves. It makes them mandatory now. But it's not unilateral action from the minister. So the minister is empowered to set the sectoral targets in consultation with the sectors. It's not a one-size-fits-all. So that's where we are coming from. That background is very important. And then we've been forced to draft the regulations. Which are sort of the guidelines on how people have to implement that. Those regulations have been put for public comment. We've received the responses which were consolidating. And once we've been able to consolidate that and see if there's a need to adjust the guidelines as per the public comments, we will do so. That is before there's a proclamation by the president. But there's also another interesting background which you must know. is solidarity, the solidarity union has always been the biggest critic of employment equity and even affirmative action. This is evidenced by the various court challenges which we have gone through. Some we have won, some solidarity has won because they were not exactly the same. So there is a body of case law in relation to this particular question. Solidarity also filed a complaint, a complaint against the Republic of South Africa government under the ILO Article 24, alleging that the implementation of employment equity and affirmative action in South Africa is non-compliant with the ILO Convention Number 111 on discrimination and occupations and employment. What the ILO did in November last year, this was filed some time back, but in November last year, the ILO requested the parties, that is the government and Solidarity Union of South Africa, 
to consider a national mediation process aimed at resolving the dispute. And this is the first time this is happening, that when there is such a complaint, instead of being referred for the dispute committees to deal with it, the dispute committee said, we've come up with a new procedure to allow the parties in dispute to see if they cannot, be res they cannot resolve those issues through the mediation. Because we have a very strong mechanism in South Africa in the form of the CCMA, this matter, the CCMA was requested to mediate on this matter. And CCMA mediated and we had the results out of the mediation. That's how we signed an agreement with solidarity. But I must emphasize, there is nothing in the agreement which is already, or which is not already included in the Constitution, in the employment uh, legislation, and the regulation, although this has been willfully ignored by Solidarity and some of the opposition parties, in particular the DA and the FF+. The only thing considered by Solidarity in terms of the need of the affirmative action is it is affirmative action is of a temporal nature trying to explain that to them. So no one then should be surprised. But I must, I must say, what does this agreement say? What does it mean? This agreement means that once we have signed that, it provides that policy uncertainty. And it also says, we're not talking about a one-size-fits-all which will be imposed on the companies. There are a number of conditions they have to meet. There are even conditions where they can justify non-compliance. That's in the Act. But here is another controversial issue, which I think uh, the chair of the ETC, Comrade Kupai, has raised. There have been an issue about, are we trying to balkanize this country? the issue of the demographics. If you look at States SA, whenever it releases the employment figures, they will talk about economically active population, both nationally and provincially, because we are sitting with a situation in South Africa where the patterns of settlement were racialized. You have a particular concentration of the colored people in the Western Cape and even Northern Cape. You can talk about that around the Durban region of the Indian people. So when companies are dealing with the employment targets, they have to take that into consideration. They can use the national demographics or the provincial de demographics. That's there in the law, not in the regulations. We're just expressing how they have to be implemented. And I want to emphasize no one from any ethnic groups would lose their job. This would be illegal and unconstitutional. It would be against the law. Lastly, Chairperson, at an international level, it will be for the first time, I want to emphasize, it will be the first time since the ILO introduced this national mediation approach that an ILO member state has successfully mediated a dispute and reached a settlement without having to appear before the International Labour Conference Committee on Labour Standards. And as such, it's setting us as an exemplar on how to use mediation internationally. And, and at a national level, clearly the recently launched or lodged a labor court case by the Solidarity and the Freedom Front, which is supporting that. 
it falls away after the agreement. Solidarity has said that they would love it to be made a court order. That's it. And unfortunately, Freedom Front has no case to support now. The DA, which is also trying to do that, they will be on their own on that. That's what we, we are dealing with here. We wanted to clarify that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have listened to the ETC chair and the two colleagues. I wish to now invite questions from uh, ourselves. I uh, will start this side, SIBC, and then we'll provide them. Thank you very much. My question is pointed to the chairperson of ETC and also to the minister or to the ETC member responsible, also responsible for government. Uh, by, in essence, the issue pertaining to the groupings in Guadalupe Natal, pertaining to the construction mafias, we saw the ABC report under your jurisdiction and government going to negotiate with the construction mafia. Is the ANC government permitting the Brazen government to go and negotiate with thugs and criminals who are masquerading as business people? Are you not surrendering the sovereignty of the state to those criminal savage behavior? To the minister, to the ABC member, Dr. Jose Barangopa. On the issues pertaining to electricity generation and transmission, what are some of the foreseeable problems you are seeing with the transmission part of the ESCOM business? Are you seeing that the transmission and the pylons are seemingly failing? I've seen that there's a massive built infrastructure project that's going on with the transmission part of the electricity business. How far you with it and what are the key elements we are seeing in the deficiencies there? Thank you. Thank you very much, Uncle. Jones, ENCA. Um, just to Mr. Kosiento, I just, just want to get a sense of, you, you spoke about power stations giving low energy availability function um, that have been identified. Uh, what are you going to be doing to ensure that you can resolve that issue in, in that particular um, department? And you spoke about transmission side of generation. Uh, you said that we'll be in worst case scenario if these kind of uh, challenges are not looked into. How urgent is it that we look into this and does it require um, you know, more financial you know, injection to actually resolve this department? And then to Mr. Nessi, just a question around that three of South Africa's big banks have been accused of being non-compliant with affirmative action laws at an executive level. Uh, are you in talks with these financial uh, departments? Is it a of concern as well. Shall I just start with those um, initially? Can take um, or we can stretch it. Like one uh, yeah, uh, well, okay, so we can stretch it. Um, Zian? Thank you very much. It's Zian Dombo from Newsroom Africa. Mine is linked to my colleague's question that's directed at Dr. Mamukopa. Um, there has been some criticism that, um, I mean, as we speak now, I see there's an announcement that load shedding has been suspended uh, temporarily. And when, when we keep getting these announcements, there are some in the energy space who are saying that the manner in which you are going about this plan, so you're trying to increase energy availability, but also in terms of the maintenance of these power stations, they're saying that you are so... It's a short-term game, but you're not dealing with the long-term problem. Um, so, so, and you just mentioned the worst-case scenario. So, what exactly is it that you're doing from a maintenance perspective, in particular when it comes to these units, that is actually sustainable in the long term? Thank you very much. To Herd. Um, also for the can we sign the conviction that we won't have any stage of production during the winter? Right, got that. I don't know if there's any other colleague. No. Um, let's proceed then. Um, uh, Chair? Okay, thank you very much. Let me start with what Sam Gelo has raised. Um, when I saw the matter as well, I was concerned um, as in my capacity as minister, but also as chair of ETC, because we do understand the impact that the construction mafia are doing on the economy. And we've called for the law enforcement agencies to be able to deal with them. So criminal activities can be in, in, a, in a way of negotiating. The explanation I got was that it was not for a broader negotiation. 
It was a particular project that was stopped and the MEC went to intervene in that particular project. One, to understand what was the problem, um, what caused the delay, is it a legitimate issue around your localization? As you know that most of the time when a big contract has been awarded, there would be SMMEs that comes in to benefit in terms of the value chain and local employment that is being done. So that was the main aim to go and ascertain the issues because definitely we are not going to, as government, we can't encourage negotiations with people who are actually going into sites and demanding percentage of money, even without lifting a finger into it. That is completely out. What has been raised with us, obviously, previously and continuously, it's around us as government ensuring that the issues of set aside are being implemented because it's a major issue. And that's why part of the work that we've been doing as ETC was to ensure that we push for the issue of public procurement bill that has been uh, concluded in cabinet through Minister of Finance that will assist in terms of legally ensuring that in areas where we require the set aside for women, for young people, those are implemented within the legal framework. We do condemn acts of disruption of projects because they deny people, for example, if you disrupt a housing project, you are denying people access to homes, you're denying people access to roads. Infrastructure creates jobs, but also ensures that they contribute in terms of economic development. So that's why we can never, ever, as government or even as NC, uh, encourage anyone who says that we will go and negotiate. There isn't a negotiation, and that's the explanation I got from the MEC, particularly in KwaZulu Natal. But we must acknowledge that this is a major issue. We continue to raise it with a security cluster. And I think uh, Comrade Mathing will explain later. I think the matter is also on the agenda of a, in, in terms of security of the NEC that we are uh, getting. What is it that they are doing to help us as well? Comrade. Shall I, shall I start with uh, Comrade? Comrade uh, yeah. I think it's one for you. Okay. We'll help you just to move them quickly. When assessments were conducted by the Employment Equity Commission, the financial sector, the banks in particular, which are listed, were found wanting on transformation. And that report was very disturbing. Now, we had agreed that as we are setting these targets, which are mandatory now, no more the targets which are voluntary, we are going to be monitoring them very strictly. But fortunately, some of those banks have on their own acknowledged those weaknesses. So definitely it's one of the sectors which will be uh, following very closely in terms of the transformation. And I want to emphasize, transformation in this country is a must, given where we're coming from. So, indeed, we'll be having conversation with uh, the individual banks in terms of their employment plans first and how they progress in terms of those plans. Thank you. Just to emphasize on employment equity Ed, and the work that is being done, um, because as Comrade Tulas is saying, some people have been going into communities, especially in colored communities, to say the ANC has abandoned colored communities. It's not true. So that's why we felt that it is important for us to come and clarify this so that everybody understands we remain as the NC pro-transformation, but the transformation is not only for black South Africans or what you call, uh, you know, um, in terms of excluding other racial groups which are previously disadvantaged communities, including, I mean, if we look at it, a, a, a women as well in terms of even white women who were disadvantaged previously. So that is important for us to emphasize uh, because we did see our detractors move from one community to the other, especially in the colored communities where they are mobilizing communities against
in this and misinformation around this area. Thank you. I thought I should emphasize that completely. Yes. Thank, yes. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues, for those uh, sets of questions. I'm going to combine the, the questions that uh, Sam Kelo and Pule raised on the transmission side. Uh, so the, the first part is that uh, you know that we have committed ourselves to a decarbonization program. We've got the nationally determined contributions. We also have the net zero path. And the aggregate of that means that uh, we have to migrate from uh, thermal sources of power, essentially moving away from uh, our natural endowment in this uh, instance, coal, because of, uh, of reasons that have been articulated before, issues around the um, uh, environment and also climate change. So there's a science that uh, computes what the adverse impact of those are. So what that simply means is that as you abandon these sources of generation, you must create new, find new sources of generation one uh, to replace uh, on a linear scale that which you are, you are removing, but also exponentially you must uh, add new generation capacity to accommodate for, for the growth of the economy, achieving uh, uh, measures such as uh, universal access. Now, if you had to do an atlas of uh, what I call it, a radiation atlas, where, where the um, areas, geographic areas with the best uh, sources of, um, of, um, of uh, um, uh, sun, you are going to find that they are located in the Northern Cape. You are doing an atlas with regards to the wind speeds is the coastal areas of the Eastern Cape, uh, Western Cape, uh, and, the, and the Northern Cape. But it is in those areas that uh, present uh, opportunities for exploitations of uh, renewables that you don't have great capacity. So it means that uh, we need to do the following. In order to benefit from uh, those renewable energy sources, we must uh, strengthen the grid so that uh, we are able to accommodate the surge that comes with the uh, with the, the addition of these uh, electrons as and when the sun decides to rise, as and when you have a significant amount of wind speed, because that can be regulated. They come as and when they want to. So that's why that's not uh, computed as base load, because base load you can, you, can, uh, you can manage. And then the second part, you need to extend the, the line. So just to give you a sense, uh, uh, in the past 10 years, ESCOM has uh, extended the lines by about 4,500 kilometers. In the next 10 years, for us to achieve that, you must extend the lines by 14,000 kilometers. So you must uh, grow it three and a half fold. So it means the following. You need financing. We know the balance sheet of ESCOM can accommodate that, and also there are conditions with regards to the fiscal support. Of course, there's an escape clause there. You can, they can ask for permission from the Minister of Finance to go and borrow. But even if they've got the right to borrow, uh, the, the balance sheet will not be able to accommodate uh, the computation that has been done is that we need upwards of 210 billion rands for us to do the issues of grid expansion and uh, grid uh, strengthening. So it's an area that requires uh, attention. And then you're asking me, when is that it should have been done yesterday? I, I think the expansion and the strengthening of the grid is important. Uh, and that's why you have a conversation in the country by private sector players of accusations of uh, other projects that are hogging what we call grid capacity. They've been given the license to access the grid, but their projects have not matured. And then there are projects that have matured, but they can't access grid capacity because they say the capacity has been exhausted and it's sitting with people who are not able to, uh, to access that. And that's why ESCOM has uh, come up with the uh, grid access rules, of course, uh, in some quarters they say. Uh, there are issues with that. I'll be meeting those players sometime next week just to explain what is it, understand what is it, uh, the issues that they are raising, and we find an amicable way of addressing it. And then um, in relation, so, and then there's the financing point of view, like I said. The financing must achieve a number of things. The first one is that you must not relinquish ownership of the grid. The state must at all times be responsible for the grid. Two is that uh, you must uh, be able to tap into the liquidity that is sitting with the private sector without undermining the state ownership of the, of the grid. The third one is that the operation of the system of the grid remains with the system operator that is ESCOM and it's not going to be, uh, if you like, uh, delegated to uh, players in that space. And we are, we are finding an expression of how we are going to achieve these three things uh, uh, in the shortest possible space of time. We are more than confident of uh, doing that. 
And then with regards to what we have done in the power station, I did make the point that we have isolated. So it's not about the power station, it's about the individual units. I think there's about 84 of these units. So just trying to understand what are the, the technical issues that are undermining the ability of these units to produce at the design day capacities, uh, talking about their reliability, they don't trip, their efficiency at the design capacity. And then once we have isolated what the technical issues are, we ask the next question, do we have the uh, internal expertise? If yes, the answer is yes, then we deploy that internal expertise to help us to resolve that problem. If we don't have, then we go to the private sector and get that expertise. It exists in the country. Throw it in and they get to be embedded. And that's why you are seeing the kind of improvements that we are making. Zianda, so if you look, so it's a very valid question you are asking. And I was listening to some of these uh, commentators. They say, no, the achievement, the improvements are artificial. First is that they are not artificial because I'm able to illustrate to you that the the energy availability factor has improved. But they say, in the course of doing that, then you are compromising maintenance. So once the energy availability factor improves, that creates an additional opportunity to do what I call opportunity maintenance. So in terms of uh, our projection, we had thought that will bring down uh, plant maintenance to about 2,500. Guess what? As a result of this uh, improvement, on average, in the past two weeks, uh, we've been able to ramp up maintenance. We are at uh, over 3,000 megawatts of uh, maintenance. We could have done uh, the most convenient, expedient thing. We could decide that we are not going to have uh, load shedding and then do away with maintenance. But we have chosen the most prudent route. That, uh, yes, at, in the evening, we are still going to have a uh, stage three of load shedding because the units were taking them out and fixing them. Otherwise, we could be expedient, play the political game, and say, no, let it run. Let these machines run. You'll not be seeing load shedding, and then we'll come here being triumphalist. But the pro problem will hit you in the next six months or so. So that's an area that we are attending to. Hurt? No, I've avoided making absolute statements. I will not say there will not be stage eight load shedding. But at the rate at which we are going, we are unlikely going to see it. What is that rate? The improvement in the energy availability factor. And I forgot to say thank you to industry and the South African population that we are bringing down demand. But we can also show you that part of that demand, remember we had projected the worst case scenario, the demand will be at about 34,000 megawatts. We are averaging about, in the last week, about 30,600 megawatts. So it's about 4,000 megawatts of reduction. And we are able to show you that it's as a result of this uh, campaign. We'll see it much better now when we are going to see the coldest period of the winter, starting Monday, especially in Gauteng. Gauteng is important. You can have cold weather in other parts of the country. Gauteng accounts for 25% of the load. So once it hits Gauteng, then you'll start to see it. I mean, the Western Cape, they've been having inclement weather. It has been cold. They've not been seeing the sun. But that has not been translated in the deterioration of the performance of the grid on the demand side. But the concentration of the load, of, it's in the northern part, 72%, and then 25% is that in Gauteng. And we know there's a cold weather that is coming. And that's why the work that we've been doing, the reliability of this unit, is important to help us to get out of this situation. When we come back to you and say we're out of load shedding, we will be out of load shedding. Because we have not been expedient, we have not taken shortcut, we are confident about our ability to maintain it. But yes, I, I, I don't foresee that we're likely going to go to those stages. I think that the system is keeping up at that 60% uh, of the EFF. Thanks, Ms. Maki. Maybe just one thing, uh, Comrade Masin. Um, Comrade Sputler speaks about the, the required resources um, for issues around transmission and the work. Our position as the ANC is that government must do whatever it takes yes. to support the recovery of the energy security. Um, and and it, because we understand the impact to households, and I say this again, we understand the impact of individual households, we understand the impact to businesses, especially SMMEs, but more importantly to economic growth. There is no way that we can see economic growth without seeing the recovery in terms of energy. So I thought from, because I think he's skating around, running away from, from saying that because that's his work, but from our side as the ETC, that's the message that we've sent to our employees in government. Loud and clear. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Thank you very much, Commissioner.
Kombetulas uh, and uh, two. Is that a, a follow up? <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> uh, different things. You have the energy minister saying that we're not letting go of these coal state issues of crime that are literally sabotaging the. The facility that is made available to South Africa, dedicated to South Africa, South Africa can tap into that, but then tapping into that means that we must enter into a, a legal obligation. What the NEC is saying is that we must not and we will not at any stage relinquish energy sovereignty of the country. I think that's important. Even in the midst of a fiscal matrix, at least for now, that is deteriorating, and we are confident that once we address the issues of uh, uh, load shedding, the issues around uh, uh, an investor climate, uh, uh, we, are, we are going to get out of this situation. Even in that uh, situation of a deteriorating fiscal matrix, uh, we are not going to relinquish uh, energy sovereignty. And that's why earlier on, when I, I was referring to the transmission side of uh, the energy ecosystem in the country is that the state will at all times remain in ownership of, uh, of the transmission side. The people will always be um, owning the transmission side and the state is a, and government rather is an agency on behalf of the people. So because that talks to your energy sovereignty, I mean that's a national key points if you come to think of it and it's important that we protect it at all costs. Of course, on the generation side, we have uh, liberalized. One of the things that the, um, uh, the ANC has insisted on is that ESCO must continue to be a player even on the renewable side. So if you look at the configuration in government, uh, ESCO is just uh, left on the generation side to be on the thermal power side. ESCO must be a market player also on the renewable side so that uh, you don't have a situation where over time, ESCOM becomes insignificant and in our developmental objective of universal access, affordability, energy security is threatened because of a, um, a, a, a generation that uh, essentially is uh, exclusively in private hands. So the, the state must uh, remain a, multi, a big player and ESCOM is an outfit that is going to help us to maintain that position and of course uh, benefiting from uh, market participation. Thank you very much, Comrade Putler. Um, Zenda, just to start with the issue around conversations with the security cluster. Um, we have been, yes, indeed, raising quite a number of issues, and I do believe they will be coming to you to brief you. I don't want to speak on their behalf. The ETC, we are inclined, if we are to put it in that context. So we have raised issues that we need their support on. And as they present as well, we'll be looking at that, giving them feedback on the areas of our concern to support the, um, to support the economic growth. So they will brief you in terms of their plans through our, our spokesperson and the SGO. So I think I'll leave it at that point that they will be able to give you conversations with us and them are continuous. Various areas where you have specific intervention, they come in, like Congress Putla was saying, when you look at um, the work that he does, there is a work stream that focuses on that support. They give you the report to say, this is what we are picking up, this is what you must pay attention to, and that is more of collaboration and support. So it varies at areas times. More support to say, be cautious of this, these are the risks, and again, in other areas, it will be that they go in and intervene. Sometimes they even give us feedback where we are a problem. For example, even on Madela Gokbona, at some point they said, you need to be clear as economy, economic cluster in your localization, because sometimes you're causing confusion for the police to understand what is it, where do they differentiate the legit person who's looking for a 30% SMME subcontracting and a person who's literally a thug. So that's some of the feedback that we get back from them as we converse. So it's a two-way process where they give us feedback where we're making it difficult for them to operate and where they are. And then the last point is around, maybe just to explain, in government, uh, between government and governments, when an MOU is signed, the, what it means is that you are agreeing to have a relationship. It's almost like in that particular area. So if you sign an MOU around energy, energy issues, that MOU means that between these two countries, let's say France and South Africa, are either going to exchange in terms of knowledge, in terms of projects, but 